Okay, so we were uh, talking about the idea of duty in order to help clarify the idea of a good law. say a goodwill, of course, you should be thinking uh, a good person. Um, and the point of the examples that Kant gives here, of duty and acting from duty, was supposed to be that um, our assessment of a person it is our judgment about whether a person is a morally praiseworthy person depends on more than just the outward conformity of their behavior to do. So in order to say that a person is a good person, or to say that a person has a good will, um, we need to ask not just as it were, what it is that they did, but why they did it. Um, so, the example that we've been talking about with Kant assumes in our common sense moral judgment that we don't think that the shopkeeper is a morally praiseworthy person if he charges a fair price only because he has some further goal that's served by doing it, like maintaining his reputation and staying business. In other words, in order to be morally praiseworthy, in order for us to say that's a good person, that that's a good will, he needs to charge a fair price for its own sake, not because doing that will bring about some other goal that he has. But even that's not enough, because he could charge a fair price for its own sake simply because he has an inclination to do that, an empirical desire to do that. So we also, in addition to knowing that he's doing that action for its own sake, as opposed to doing that action in order to bring about some further end, we also need to know why it is that he's doing it for its own sake. Um, and if it's not be, and if it's not, because he happens to like doing that, um, if it's because he recognizes that that's what's morally required of him, uh, that's what duty requires, then we would say that's a virtuous person. That's a good person. He has a good will. So think about it this way. Um, um, we, were, we started out looking for something that's unconditionally good. We started out looking for something that was the condition for other conditional goods to be good. And this is supposed to be a good will. This is supposed to be a good person. So the person who charges a fair price because that would help his reputation, um, that person uh, is maybe doing the right thing under those circumstances. But we might say, like, exactly that same person, unchanged in any way, exactly that same will, if he were in different circumstances, wouldn't charge the fair price. Okay, so it's only, as it were, a lucky coincidence that the way to accomplish his actual end, staying in business, in these circumstances requires that he charge a fair price. But, as it were, exactly that same person, exactly that same will, in other circumstances, would not do the right thing. So, that person who charges a fair price only because, in these circumstances, it would help his business, that person, we would want to say, is not unconditionally good. It's only in those circumstances that he's doing the right thing. And similarly, the, I mean, this, is, this was my example, not Kant's. Similarly, we can imagine a shopkeeper who charges a fair price because he happens to like that kid. And he happens to have an empirical inclination to do so in these circumstances. It's exactly the same thing. He's doing the right thing, but exactly that same person 
exactly that same will, in other circumstances, wouldn't be doing the right thing. And so he is not, his will in that case is not on the condition of good. So it's only someone who is acting in the right way, so to speak, for the right reason, that we can say he would do that uh, unconditionally. That is, if that's his will. Okay, so the point is, in the course of um, this um, discussion, Kant introduces the term maxim. He doesn't really tell us what this is yet, um, but later on, he, um, on page 16, there's a footnote with an asterisk, with a star, and he says there, a maxim is the subjective principle of the will. Um, so, uh, whenever we will, Kant thinks, we do so on some principle or other. And it's a principle, so a maxim is going to be general. So it's a principle, it's a kind of rule of conduct that we give ourselves. So, um, and look, and this is going to tell us something about our character. This is going to tell us something about the kind of person that we are. What principles we have. Um, so again, we'll talk about this more later, but I want to try to get clear about what's going on here. So if our assessment of a person's character our assessment of whether someone is a good person or not is based on their maximum. Well, then all of these things that we've been talking about have to be included there. So not just when we will, we will some action, we will some, some we do something, but also we need to include, as it were, the reasons why we're doing that, so that we can distinguish between the shopkeeper who's charging a fair price in order to accomplish some further end. And the shopkeeper who's charging a fair price because he recognizes that that's what's required. So, so we need to construct a maxim, we need to understand what a maxim is, in a way that incorporates all that information. Um, so here's how I think you should think about maxims. They, they will be of this form. So they need to be a, print, a subjective principle so I do something, um, and it has to be a you know, subjective principle of willing, so I'm going to will A in C because of R. So A is supposed to be the action that I'm willing, sort of the outward manifestation of it. C is the circumstances in which I'll do that, or I do that. And R, I say, is the reason why. So R is the basis for doing it. Okay. So um, I've said that every act of willing aims at some goal, aims at some end, has some purpose. Um, so where in the maxim in this form is the goal or purpose? Well, the answer depends on the maxim in the following way. Um, sometimes when we act, um, like if we charge a fair price, we do this in order to accomplish some further end. So sometimes we act instrumentally. So in that case, our maxim will say, I, in certain, certain circumstances, in circumstances C, I will do a certain thing, A, because, well, because A will cause something else to happen. A will be instrumentally valuable in pursuing some further goal. So if our maxim is an instrumental one in that way, the goal that we have is R. So the reason why, so where is the end or the goal of an action? Well, it's going to be R when the action is instrumental. 
So in some maxims, we'll say, I'm going to do A in certain circumstances because doing that will further my goal of accomplishing some further action. So that's what it is. Is that clear? So, like, uh, because R means because A will cause R. Okay, but sometimes we don't have a further goal. Sometimes we think that we do something because we think it's worth doing regardless of further events that it may cause. In that case, A itself is going to be the goal. The action is itself worth doing. Um, okay, so sometimes the goal will be R when A, the thing we do, is going to lead to that. Sometimes it will be A itself. And then the question is, what's R? So if our action is something that we think is worth doing for its own sake, a maxim is still going to have to tell us why we think it's worth doing for its own sake. And that will be included, that will be stated in um, so sometimes Kant talks about uh, the reason for doing that as the incentive. The incentive. What it is about A that makes it seem worth doing. 